It was first built between 1861 and 1869, but unfortunately during Second World War there was a bomb attack and five bombs hit the Opera House then and they destroyed about 70% of the old and original building. So there is not much left of the old house, but of course we're going to have a look at all of the old parts that had not been damaged uh, during Second World War. And even as some of the modern sections of the house that had been reconstructed after Second World War, between 1945 and 1955 roughly. So um, we are now in the right wing of the building and this is one of the modern sections of the house. So this intermission hall here has been created only during the 50s of the 20th century and it is dedicated to Gustav Mahler, one of our former opera directors, who you can see in this very modern portrait up there. Gustav Mahler worked here between 1897 and 1907 and he was a very strict director indeed. He had one motto when working here and that was discipline, discipline and now more even discipline. And just because of his discipline the quality of the shows really rose and that's how this opera house got famous all over the, over the world in the end. So we are quite thankful to Mahler nowadays. Um, the room itself, ladies and gentlemen, is a very, very precious one. So if you turn around and have a look all over, we're going to move down now a little bit to make you see more of it, of course. First, I need to mention this exhibition, these exhibition boxes, I used to call them. Um, <coughs> these are part of a non-permanent exhibition. And um, it's all about the time when Hitler moved in uh, Austria by now and the opera's position then and so on. And anyway, the room is very precious because of all of these tapestries that you can see on the walls and even on the doors just on your left hand side now around. These tapestries have all been made during the 50s of the 20th century too by 20 women working upon them six years, everything is handmade and they created about 12,000 different shades of colors. So within all of them together, of course, it's about 12,000 different shades of colors. That's an amazing number. Nobody will ever be able to repaint that and that's what makes it then so very precious. If you are interested in having a close look, you may step close, it's no problem, they are behind glass. So they took the basic colors and made very many different mixes all between these colors by using darker levels, lighter levels, and so on. And that's how they got it all out. And on some of these tapestries, there are figures of looks like opera, magic blue. So we are quite close, standing out to one of the most popular figures of the magic flute on the left here. It is Papageno, the one that catches the birds. And on the next wall, you can see his fiancée, Papagena, just very close. In the corner, just down there on the right hand side, close to the first window, just a little bit hidden, I would say, is the Prince Camino. So just some examples. And we're going to move through this kind of secret door now. Out, please don't touch the door, but you may have a close look once again. get that reaction? Pardon? Does it always get that reaction? Wow. Um, I'd like to say most of the time, but I can't because I, <laughs> I don't hear that always. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, now we are in one of the old parts of the house that is in the very front of the building. So if you have a look all in here, you can see the typical interior of the old building, including very many different elements, well, like uh, different materials, like stone, marble, gold, wood, and so on. Very many different decorations, different paintings, and pots, and so on. And this room always has been in use as an intermission hall. In former days, it was just used by nobility or aristocracy. It is called Schwind Foyer. For all of the paintings that you can see on the top of the walls were made by Moritz von Schwind and they do show some themes of very famous operas that have been performed on our stage quite often during the 19th century. And under the paintings everywhere you can see the busts of the composers of these operas. So you, you may find some familiar names in here Composers who are still popular, but even some who are already out of fame, like um, Boyle, most. Yeah. Yes, Boyle, Most of, of these here in the corner, just around, are all a bit forgotten by now, at least in Central Europe, like Spontini, Marschner, Boyle, Gerubini. But we may step just a bit more into the center. And I will see some other names that are just more famous still, more remarkable maybe. And like for example, at the window side in the center, one box showing Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. And the painting above is divided into three sections showing three of his operas. On the left, it is an image of the Nozze di Figaro, the, the marriage of Figaro. In the center, it is Prince and Princess of the Magic Flute. And on the right, it is an image of Don Giovanni. And the opera Don Giovanni was shown as the first opera, the first production in the house, on May 25th in 1869. Whereas the opera Fidelio, that is far more in the corner, still at the window side, um, and it was written by Beethoven, was shown as the first production after Second World War. So um, in 1955, when the house was reopened again. And well, you may find some more familiar names in here now, but I'd like you please even to pay attention to eye level. So all around, there are some busts showing former opera directors of the house, artificial managers. I'd like to start with the one in, well, close to the mirror where we came in, well, just a bit to this direction, right? It is one bust showing Richard Strauss, or Richard Strauss, just at eye level. And Richard Strauss worked here as the artificial manager between 1919 and 1924. The next one on the left is Karl Böhm, who was director all around Second World War. Now in the center, close to us, is Herbert von Karajan, who worked here during the 50s and 60s and was the first director who wanted all of the operas just to be sung in the original languages. So since then, they always stick to the libretto. You wouldn't hear any translations in the opera performances usually in the house. The next one shows Lebens Kraus. You may get a bit further and a bit closer. And the one in the center, I mean, in front of the other mirror, shows Gustav Mahler again. And this bust is said to be an original one made by the very famous French artist Auguste Baudin. Did you have heard of Baudin? This is said to be an original one and certainly not present very proud of it. So if you can take note of this, it would be very thankful to you. Thank you very much. Now let's have a look at the garden. Down there is the Ring Street, the 
the street that goes around the city centre. So this is under us, the main entrance. And the balcony is very old and it also has been, had been painted by Moritz von Schwinn, especially uh, the figures of the ceiling that once again do show some figures or some characters of the land flowed by Mozart. And as you can see, all of these um, uh, fresco and paintings already suffered because of the weather. So windy, stormy, rainy weather, wet weather, weather and so on is a big problem here. Well, it used to be a big problem here. But nowadays they always do put up this glassy wall here during winter times so or during cold and wet season just to close the balcony to protect colors and frescoes from the weather from fading and during springtime they take it away again so then we use it once more as a balcony so that's just done to keep it all alive which is of course very important here and next we're going to move just um, through the room Of how that all works, still on our tour. But where do the 
rehearsals take place? Not and really. Some do take place, but sometimes they do take place on the stage. Yeah. And most of them do take place in some special rehearsals yes. that are in the right wing of the building, oh, just a bit more than yeah. the back. Everything that looks golden inside is made of gold leaf by 22 carat and a special thing in there are the tapestries all over but that is golden yellow silk with the crown monogram of the emperor and the emperor then was Franz Josef I of Habsburg maybe you heard of that name before since we got no emperor anymore now the doors here usually are always kept close to the public so apart from our guided tours, you could never have a look into this room here. That's why I do recommend to take pictures of it now, if you'd like to do so at all, of course. And um, even during the evening shows, it's always closed. But if you would ever like to enter this room, you could do so by renting it. Uh, and if you would ever like to rent this one? How much? Um, uh, you know, it is um, 500 euro. Uh, if, we, if we share it, it would not seem to be that much, right? But the problem is that it's only for 20 minutes and without champagne and anything yet included. So um, it gets more expensive, more expensive. That's a problem. But um, uh, whenever official guests do visit this opera house, um, um, they are quite often even invited into this room. So there are press conferences and interviews given in there and so on. So um, not only the renting, but even the official, um, well, the official function is still fulfilled in here. Now I'm going to stand on the main street. Well, no, okay, that's maybe because um, it's a better view. Just to move around once again. Yeah. Oh. I remember you like that. <laughs> Completely, and it's all more than in the back. 
and down here, so under us is the main staircase. And um, if you do look straight ahead now, just at eye level, in the center you can see three big windows which are part of the tea room again. So the left and right of these windows, you can see one golden circle each, showing the architects of the old house. On the left it is Edward van der Mill, and on the right, and on the right hand side it is August Sickhardt von Sickhardt's work. Now on the, on the top of the wall, straight ahead, you can see three beautiful paintings by Franz Dobiachowski. I know we do have nice names here, anyway. I'm <laughs> um, showing on the left the allegory of ballet, the dancing lady. In the center the allegory of tragic opera and on the right the allegory of comical opera or the opera buffa. And the two big reliefs underneath do repeat the motto of the shows again, left <coughs> ballet and right opera. Well these are the only beats we were talking about the program before, eh? only opera and ballet. But still we do have exceptions here that um, which is two exceptions during the year. One exception takes place at New Year's Eve. That is one operette usually by Johann Strauss, called Die Fledermaus, the bat, and sometimes by Franz Lear, the merry widow. And in May, there's always one concert that is dedicated to Gustav Mahler, well, um, our former opera director we were discussing before. Next, we're going now to move down the main staircase here. So, um, yeah, and then we're going to have a look into the auditorium. Can you say anything about those statues here? No. She didn't. <laughs> Never mind. She cannot remember anything. Not everything. 